Good morning, Hagerstown Church of the Nazarene. I feel like this morning that I need to introduce myself to you. Um, you might recognize my voice, but you might not recognize me. Uh, I'm usually, if you're, if you're new here, um, it's, I, I'm usually up here with a big red ginger beard, okay? Um, really full, um, but obviously I don't have that. And, and that happens for one of two reasons. Either as I'm trimming it and, and cleaning it up a little bit, I might mess up and, you know, thus we got to get, get rid of it. That's, that's one reason. Or the second reason is it's teen camp week. And in this case, we just got done with teen camp week. And so um, I have a few pictures that I want to show you. In the first one, we, Adam, you can go ahead and throw that up there. Here is the reason why it is shaven, okay? Um, I ask, you know, I ask the teens all the time. I say, hey, you know, uh, should I just keep this? Should I keep it for church? And, and everyone's like, yeah, you should totally rock it. And so some of them this morning were like, you know, what? Like, where, did, where is it? It's gone. Like, why did you shave? But then, you know, the, the real boss, I asked Ashley. And she said, get rid of it now as quickly as possible. So uh, this is Colonel Mustard. Uh, we, we play Real Life Clue uh, on the Wednesday night of team camp. And so I was Colonel Mustard, and, uh, and we had a, had a great time with that. I got a few more pictures because team camp was just incredible. If you want to go to that next one, Adam. All right, so here is a picture. We had so many kids that we literally maxed out the campground, and we had to get a drone to take our picture. It was pretty amazing. We had 302 of us, and uh, it was just an awesome time. We'll go to that next picture. We had a lot of fun. There was a lot of things. Uh, there's Chloe Smith, one of our uh, graduated seniors, and she's riding a horse. There's horses to ride. You can go to the next picture. Next one, there's, uh, if you, you might not be able to recognize him either, but that's Zachary Yannick. Uh, covered in shaving cream from our shaving cream battle. Go to the next one. All right, there is our group from Hagerstown. They are, they are just incredible, and it was a joy to spend time with them uh, this week. And then I think there's one more picture for us. All right, um, here is, man, we had a lot of fun, as you could tell, in a, just a couple of those pictures. If you've seen anything else on, on my Facebook or Instagram, You've seen that there was, you know, a lot of fun and a lot of great memories that were had. But in this room, there's nothing special about this room. Um, at teen, you know, teen camp, you got the, the cafeteria food, the camp food, right? You got uh, the sleeping arrangements that, you know, by day two, I mean, it, you know, in there with a whole bunch of smelly, stinky uh, sixth and seventh graders. That's, that's where I was, okay? Um, it was nice to be back in my own bed and own air to be able to breathe again. Um, but, you know, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of all the chaos, the Holy Spirit just fell. And God is at work in our young people. And it was incredible. Uh, there was, yeah. <clears throat> I wish I had the picture to show you, but um, there, was a, there was a moment when our, our theme for the week was all in. And our speaker there, uh, Stretch Dean, came in and, and just shared story after story and was just captivating. And these, these teenagers were just glued. You know, they were not asleep. They were involved. They were jumping up in worship. They were hands raised. I mean, there was passionate worship. But in the moment where there was a decision to be made, and Stretch said, all right, on the count of three, if you want to go all in with Jesus, I want you to just jump right up. He goes, one, two, three. Students just popped up, over 200. I, we couldn't even count them all. It was just incredible. And, I mean, they were coming up to the adult leaders that were around the room, just a mess. The Holy Spirit was just wrecking them, and they just came up and just said, I chose to go all in. And so that, that's just, I just wanted to give you that report, um, that God is at work. But I was, I was thinking about that. Going all in doesn't just happen, have to happen at things like teen camp or Nazarene Youth Conference. But it can happen right here. This morning, it can happen. And so I want to just give that invitation. Let's go all in. Let's make that decision. Let's, let's, not, let's, not wait. let's not wait until we get our lives figured out. Let's just make that decision and say, if you haven't gone all in with Jesus, 
What are you waiting for? It, it, you're, you're on the sidelines. You're on the fence. Let's jump in. Let's go all in with Jesus because he is worth it and he is moving. He is doing a new thing. And let's join him in it. And I just wonder, you know, what would it look like this morning if we just said, you know what, for worship, we're going all in. You know, we're not going to care about what other people are, are think of us. Let's, let's just worship the Lord and let's just say we are going all in. Lord, here is all of our heart. Here is all of our life. We surrender it to you and we just trust you and we go all in. And so I want to just, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, but I, I invite you to stand with us as we, as we get ready to, to worship the Lord. Uh, but let me just pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, and Holy Spirit, we just pray that you would just come and rest on us this morning, Lord. Lord, we recognize that we all need you. Lord, without you, we are nothing. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would go all in with you this morning. Thank you for what you did at team camp, but Lord, I don't want it just to stay there. I want it to be here, Lord. So I pray for our hearts this morning that we would be open to just saying, God, I've been holding back things, and God, I'm just here. I'm here for you. I'm just making that decision to go all in. I want you to have all of my heart, all of my worship, all of my praise, all of my attention. God, you can have my life. We give it to you, and we want to worship you with everything. Lord, may you be pleased and honored in it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship. Good morning, everybody. So, just to give you a heads up, I know today is an emotional day for a lot of people. I personally have had a pretty awful week. Um, by Wednesday, I wasn't even sure I would be able to sing today. I was... I couldn't even listen to the songs on the radio without just sobbing. Thursday and Friday, I was able to sing. Last night, I was a blubbering mess again. So we're here today. I'm just letting you know. The emotions are there. They're not just there for me. I know they're there for all of you. But y'all sing. Praise God the way you want to. Make whatever blubbery noise you need to. And if you hear me, you may not want to. I'm sorry. I don't know. I was doing okay earlier. Um, I'll be in and out, so I'm letting y'all do your thing.
Sandy always does this to me. I'm home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's in the past.
the Spirit of the Lord is near. The evidence is all around that the Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. But the Spirit of the Lord is
Just roll with me.
The Lord is good, and he's here. Let's talk to him. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence that meets us where we're at, God. Lord, even if we've been running the other direction from you, you have been right there pursuing us. Lord, coming after our heart, coming after our lives, Lord, because you want nothing else but, than, but for us. God, you created us to be with you, Lord. And Lord, you hated it when we chose sin over you. And Lord, we're all guilty of it. So Lord, we confess our sins to you. We, we confess the things that we've fallen short. We confess the times that we've run, ran from you, God. We've we confess the things that are just not right in our lives. And we say, Lord, we want to be done with those things. We're tired of running. All we want to do is to run back into your arms because, Lord, that is where you are. Your arms are stretched wide open and you are just calling us by name, calling us home. And so, Lord Jesus, would you meet us there? Would you speak to our hearts, God? Would you remind us that you are for us? That you're not against us? Lord, would you help us to see what you want us to see? And help us to feel what, we want, what you want us to feel, God. Lord, we lay our lives down. We give you our hearts. We give you this space to move and to speak. So, Lord, would you do it? God, we thank you that we have this church family, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we can lean on, that we can talk things through, that we can cry on shoulders with, that we can celebrate the winds. God, thank you for this community of faith that you've given us called the church. Lord, it is not this building, but it is this people, this people that is a family. Lord, thank you for this family. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your love. Lord, where would we be without you? Lord, Jesus, thank you for who you are and for all that you've done. Lord, what a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name the name of Jesus, Lord. And we speak the name of Jesus over every single situation, over every single life in here. Lord, would you move and would you give us what we need, Lord, and would your spirit come down and your will be done as it is in heaven. May it be so here on earth as well. Father, this is our prayer. We give you ourselves. We are here for you. Our full attention is yours. And we invite you to do what you want. We are listening, Lord. Speak to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, this morning, I, uh, we have a couple, couple special things that we, that we want to do. And uh, one of those is uh, we, I, I'm going to invite our incredible children's director up, uh, Miss Alicia Yannick. And as she comes, can we just, just say thank you for all that she does for our kids, for our church? And, and I know this is probably the last thing that she wants to do. Is it, She's kind of like me sometimes where she likes to lead from the back. And, um, but this is something uh, that Alicia approached us last year with, and um, she said, you know what, I want to, I want to, like, grow as a, as a children's director. I want to keep learning. I want to, I want to take some courses. I want to keep growing in that, and so um, I have a little certificate here, and I, I don't think there's public recognition of this other than this, so we, we wanted to recognize her as her church family and, and the support as she has uh, sought to grow um, in, in ministry and in her, in her leadership and her giftings, and so she took, I think it was eight courses, right? Eight courses over the last few months of uh, just within children's ministry with how to, how to lead volunteers, you know, how to connect with, teen, or with kids, not, I'm speaking for me, 
speak from to kids, which is very different than teens, right? Different style. And there's a lot of things uh, to learn and to grow. And I know that was a huge thing. And it, it also took some sacrifice for the family to, to be able to do it. Um, but I have this certificate here. It's from Group Publishing, and um, it's in uh, uh, partnership with Colorado Christian University. And so um, it's a legit certificate, but it says Group U Ministry Training Center is proud to present the certification in children's ministry to Alicia Yannick on this 15th day of July, 2023, in recognition and celebration of her completion of all her, all the course requirements, earning 32 contact hours. And so uh, we want to present this and congratulate Alicia with that. And I'm going to have Alicia um, stay up here too, um, but she, uh, we're, we're super proud of you and excited uh, to see what God continues to do, right? And so we'll keep praying for her as she continues to grow, and, and we'll keep stepping up in ways that she needs because it takes a village to be able to, to lead um, children to Christ. And so, um, so maybe if you are interested in it, talk to Alicia. She can find, she can find you a space, okay? Um, so that's, that is awesome, and congratulations. We're so proud of you, Alicia. All right, the next thing we want to do is actually I want to invite uh, Car- Caroline and James and their family. I think they're back here. If you all want to come on up, everyone can come on up, family or friends, whoever's here that wants to come, come on up to the stage. Uh, today we're going we're gonna to have a couple uh, children dedications, and so uh, it's been a little bit since we've had these, and uh, uh, but it's a special time um, in, in their lives uh, where uh, we, we pray, we dedicate these, these children to the Lord. And, and if they make noise, they cry. That's, that's part of it, right? Switch mic here. There we go. So up here, so we have, we have Caroline, and we have James, we have Michael and Ryan, and we have, we have our two that we're dedicating, Cameron, who's this, this little guy right here, he's three years old, right, three-year-old. And then we also have Kinsey, who I believe just turned one, right, this month, just turned one. And so uh, we're excited, excited to have them here. And uh, I want to read, I want to read from, uh, from Matthew chapter 19. And uh, it, in verse 13, it says, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And so even when the, those disciples, you know, might have been irritated because, you know, the, the little kids were running up, they were making noise, they were crying, they were you know, trying to play with Jesus, and they were distracting Jesus, and they said, no, 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 like, he's got other things to do, he's got more important things, he's got to, he, he's got to heal people, he's got to do all these miracles, Jesus says, no, 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 you're missing it, friends, this is what it's all about, the keys on the piano, it's perfect, <laughs> right, Jesus says, come to me, right, come to me, because he cares so deeply, and so I want to, I want to talk to the parents, because uh, when, when the children are of this age, we, we want them to know the Lord at a young age. Uh, but right now, they, you know, they don't have, have that right now. But what, what this becomes is our parents saying, we want to raise our children to know the Lord. And we are going to do everything in our power to do that. And so in presenting these children for dedication, you both as parents signify not only your faith, Christian faith, but also your desire that they may early know and follow the will of God, that they would live all their days as Christians and that they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior and live with him 
forever. And in order to accomplish this, there's, there's a role to play, right? It will be your duty as parents to teach them early on, early on to fear the Lord, to watch over their education, that they would not be led astray, to direct their youthful minds to the holy scriptures, to the word of God, and to be the hands and feet of Christ, to restrain them from the evil associates and habits of this world, and doing the best that you can to bring them up in the nature and the measure of the faith in Jesus Christ. And so if this is your will and your, your hope and your prayer for your kids, will you endeavor to do this with the help of God? And if so, the answer is we will. And now I want to ask the congregation, all of us, the body of Christ, Will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to support, to pray for, to encourage these parents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to these children and to assist them in their growth towards Christ and towards maturity? And if so, answer, we will. We will. I know. Jerem, I know when you say that you'll do it, we will. So continue to do that. Are going to now dedicate them and let's see we got we got Cameron Cameron hey buddy how are you how are you do you need to sleep on your bed a little bit come here look at all these kids all right I'm gonna dedicate you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit God bless you brother dedicate you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give, give you those, okay? And let's pray a prayer, prayer of blessing over this family, shall we? Let's, let's pray for them. If you want to extend your hands out towards this family, that would be, that'd be great, too. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are the God who created Lord, you have created Kinsey and Cameron, Lord. You have formed them. You knit them together so beautifully, God. You have given them such amazing personalities, God. And you have a plan for their life. And Lord, right now, we dedicate them to you. We give them to you, Lord. And we say that we will support them. And we will love them. And we will help them. So Lord, guide their path. Bring your mercies and forgiveness to them, Lord. Guide their steps. Lord, protect them, I pray. And Lord, for the parents, Lord, for James and for Caroline, Lord, I pray that you would give them wisdom. Lord, I pray that you would give them patience and discernment, Lord, and that you would help them as their parents to, uh, to lead them to you, to read the scriptures, to pray over them, to guide them, Lord. And I pray that you would bless them. And I pray that as us, as their church family, that we would just surround them, that we would love on them, that we would pray for them, that, that we would teach their Sunday school classes and come alongside and, and, and teach them at VBS. And Lord, that, that we would just help and be an assistance to them because it takes a village to raise children. And so, Lord, we thank you for this family. We praise you for them. We give them to you. Lord, thank you for Cameron and for Kinsey. And we give them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so I'm going to pass this over to Alicia. Yeah, you can give it up for them. And from our church, we have a little gift that we want to give. And I'm going to let Alicia present those. On behalf of the children's ministries, we just want to give you a thank you, God, and a lot of thanks for Kenzie with the um, college story book. And for Cameron, who we gave, we have a children's Bible for you. And we just hope, we give these in hope that you'll read them with them and just teach them God's love. All right. Can we give it up for this family? You can have a seat. All right. And as they go, um, we'll go ahead and uh, 
dismiss uh, all of our kiddos at this point. Uh, so those who are in pre-K through the fourth grade, they can all head back and down with their, their teachers and uh, for, for a lesson. And as they go, I want to um, invite up uh, Keith Lyons. He is going to be coming and sharing uh, the announcements with us before we hear the word of God. And so Keith is is on our church board, and we're, we're grateful for him. I'm going to, would you prefer this one, or this one? Let's do this one. I'll use Pastor Wilson's friend right here. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. Uh, just as a reminder, our church offering boxes are in the back. If you would like to uh, place your offering in there, uh, you may also uh, give online with the church website, or we have an app that you can use. And we appreciate everyone's faithfulness in giving. Uh, obviously, you've seen by the tables outside, we have a farewell reception for uh, Pastor Little and his family uh, following our service today, and everyone's invited. Uh, it's a dessert, so you can go out there and have your just dessert, right? Uh, there's going to be a children's council meeting Tuesday, August the 1st at 6.30 p.m. Uh, they'll have that meeting in the children's uh, classroom, children's church classroom. Uh, also, uh, Pastor uh, Kevin and his family could use some help. Uh, they're planning to move on August the 5th. So uh, they're going to have some pizza, and anyone who's willing to help, uh, please arrive at the Parsonage by 9 a.m., Put that on your calendar, and if you're available, I know they would appreciate any any assistance. Uh, we're going to have a church picnic on Sunday, August the 13th, at the Washington County Regional Park. Uh, they plan to eat around noon, and there's going to be chicken provided as well as desserts. So you want to bring something to eat, and uh, the, they give you a list of items to bring. Uh, bring your favorite large or hot, cold or side dish. Uh, bring drinks for your family. Now, there will be a few cases of water available, and then bring your favorite games to play, like lawn games or car games or board games. And if you have any questions, please uh, direct those to Ms. Karen Yoder of the Women's Ministry. She's our Women's Ministry Director. There's also going to be a men's uh, ministry event, and it's actually going to be Saturday, August the 19th. And uh, that's an updated date. Uh, that's been a change in that, but it's for the Little League World Series up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So if you have any questions about that, uh, see uh, Tim Cliff or Brian Lewis. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer, and uh, if you have any of those questions about this event, please talk to them. Uh, Micah's Backpack, we have needs for that. Uh, for the month of August, Micah's Backpack will be collecting box boxes and of uh, individual oatmeal packets and uh, uh, other items that they need. Micah's backpack provides meals for the, to help feed the hungry children in our community. And there's a box in the Welcome Center for donations if you'd like to do that. Uh, also, we're having Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Uh, we're collecting items on a monthly basis in the donation boxes in the Welcome Center. And our goal this year is to fill 100 boxes. So uh, this month coming up, the donations are for pencil pouches, pencils, and colored pencils. All right. Uh, another thing we want to make you aware of is uh, keep praying for our our church, and our, as our, we search for our, uh, a new pastor, uh, we're greatly appreciative of of uh, Kevin and uh, and his family. But as they leave us now, we're still searching for for a replacement. And there is a process in effect. Uh, Dr. Bowser has been working with us very closely. Uh, and it's kind of moving along. And we're in, in uh, advanced stages, I think, of our search. And, uh, but just keep praying for us that God will step in and, and show us the person that he's already selected. So, uh, but in the meantime, we're very appreciative of Pastor Wilson and Miss Ruth for uh, what they've been doing for us. And, and we really, really appreciate it. Okay, me and my friend will part. For those of you who haven't been here, I have just about killed that friend.
It was June the 15th, 1964, a day that will live in infamy in the history of the city of Chicago. It's still very vivid in my mind. I was just finishing the eighth grade and moving on to high school. On that date, the Chicago Cubs traded a promising young outfielder named Lou Brock to the St. Louis Cardinals for a veteran pitcher named Ernie Brolio. Now, it happened immediately. I mean, on that day, June the 15th, Brock and Brolio switched teams and switched uniforms, but the ramifications of that trade went on for decades. Brock went on to have a stellar career with the Cardinals. His lifetime batting average was 293. If you're not a baseball fan, that's pretty doggone good. He accumulated over 3,000 hits. That's an incredible milestone. At the end of his career, he had stolen 938 bases, which at the time was a major league record. He was an all-star six times. He led the Cardinals to two World Series championships. When he retired, the Cardinals retired his number 20. No one has worn it since then. In 1985, he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame on, in the very first year of his eligibility. To this day, Cardinal fans are in love with Lou Brock. He had a brilliant career. Brolio, on the other hand, is another story. That veteran pitcher four years earlier, had led the National League in wins with 21 wins. The previous year, just the year before, 1963, he had 18 wins. Very good pitcher. But unknown to the Cubs, Brolio was damaged goods. He had arm problems. In his two and a half years with the Cubs before retiring in 1966, his record was 7 and 19. If you're not a, a baseball fan, let me just clue you in. That ain't good. To this day, it is considered by most Cub fans to be the absolute worst trade in the team's history. Now, what I want you to take away from that is this the, tr the trade happened in a moment but there were ongoing consequences from it. Now, in, in dealing with this concept of the immediate and the ongoing, it isn't always negative. In, in fact, sometimes it's very, very positive. Uh, let me tell you uh, about a man I know in, in New England, in Massachusetts. His name is David Burgers. In 1989, David graduated from Eastern Nazarene College with a degree in history. Three years later, 1992, he graduated from Yale Law School, the number one law school in the nation. He went on to have a rather stellar career with the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. Interestingly enough, he did not set out to be a securities and investments attorney. After Yale, he had gone into private practice at a major Boston law firm, and, and at one point, one of his clients was a, a brokerage firm that needed help in retaining a restraining order on a broker who was defrauding clients. While working on that case, David came to realize what a significant role the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, plays in the protection of investors, not just big money investors like you hear on TV, but folks, you know, Anyone with a retirement account is an investor. That immediate experience put into motion a series of ongoing steps. By 1998, David had joined the staff of the SEC. By 2006, eight years later, he was appointed director of the Boston Regional Office, which covers all of New England, and has oversight of thousands of financial firms. In his time with the SEC, he helped recover over one billion, that's with a B, one billion dollars for investors. 
Uh, along the way, David received the Stanley Sporkin Award, which is the SEC's highest enforcement honor. That case back there early in his career happened in an immediate short period of time, but the results are still ongoing this morning. Well, for the last half of the summer, I'd like for us to go camping. Now, I know some of you are camping enthusiasts. How many have been camping this summer? Oh, yeah, I can I see if, yeah, yeah. How many still have plans to go camping? Oh, most of it's done. Okay. I want us to go camping. I want us to camp out in Romans chapter 12. Uh, in my mind, this is an incredibly pivotal passage of Scripture that, that would be good for us to just unpack together. The Apostle Paul is talking about holy living. And the first paragraph in chapter 12 has to do with this concept of the immediate and the ongoing. Uh, let's go to those first two verses and just get them before us this morning. This is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices... Holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, quite obviously, this passage occurs in a letter, a letter that the Apostle Paul was writing to the believers in, in Rome. There are always several important things to know about a letter. For, for instance, who is the sender? You know, if it's, if it's anonymous, stop right there. Read no further. Just file it in that circular thing behind you. But not only is it important to know the sender, who the sender is, but who, what's the subject? And it's important to know who is the addressee? Who is it being sent to? I was, I was reminded of that again a few years ago uh, when I, uh, I went out to get the mail one day. You all do that. And there in the mail was a small package from a mail order pharmacy that we happen to use. Many of you do the very same thing. Uh, like most uh, of those pharmacies, they just automatically send the refills when it's time. And I'm, I'm always appreciative. So I didn't think anything about it. This is something we do on, on a fairly routine basis. When I got inside, I opened the package, took out one of the bottles. Hmm. That's strange, I said to myself. That's not a medication I take. Only then did it occur to me to look at the identity of the addressee. Um, it was one person, it was a person one block over. They had the right house number, just the wrong street. So I retaped the package and sheepishly delivered it to a nice elderly man, man one block over. So, so let's make sure we know who the addressee is for this passage. The apostle gives us a couple of really strong clues. The first one is he addresses them as brothers, and that's generic. It's, it's, it's brothers and, and sisters. So, so who is that? Well, that's fellow believers. Guys, can we go back to verse 1 and just have that up there? Thank you. Oh, it does say brothers and sisters. Good. It's fellow believers. You see, the Christians in, in the very first century often referred to each other as brothers and sisters. If, if you're my, my age or older, you may, be re, may remember the day in the church when we did the very same thing. I mean, in my home church, there was, there was Brother Geeting, Sister McClarty, Brother Prather, just, just to name a few, fellow believers. But there's another even stronger clue here. Paul is urging these folks to do something in view of, in light of, God's mercy. 
So is this just a casual phrase, or is he pointing to something in particular? What do we mean by mercy? One definition of mercy is this. It's the withholding of what we really deserve. Now, throughout this letter, the apostle has repeatedly returned to the subject of Christ's sacrificial death for us. For instance, back in chapter 3, he says this, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be the just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Paul is declaring that as believers, we are the recipients of God's mercy in Christ. God has withheld from us what we deserve for our sins. Eternal punishment, right? Christ took our place on the cross as a sacrifice of atonement. Our sins have been forgiven, not because of who we are or what, anything we've done, but because of the blood of Christ. God's mercy has been lavished on us. We have been drenched in it. So who are the addressees? Well, they're the forgiven believers in Christ. They are true born-again Christians. So the apostle declares to these believers, therefore, in view of God's mercy. In other words, in response to God's saving grace in your lives that has forgiven your sins and made you a child of God, Paul is urging them to do something in, in response. Think for a moment of what Christ has done for us that he's forgiven us, that he's, he's made a way to God and, and someday a home in heaven. Uh, shouldn't there be maybe a, a response to that? Well, now the apostle starts using sacrificial language. You'll, you'll notice that there. Remember, Paul grew up in and around the temple in Jerusalem, and this is where he studied under that great rabbi Gamaliel. Literally thousands of times, he has watched a worshiper Lead a lamb to the altar in the temple to make a sacrifice. Now, when that worshiper did that, the priest would take the lamb, slay it, and place it on the altar as a burnt offering. This is the picture that Paul has in mind as he urges believers to offer this sacrifice to God. There's only one distinction between them. This sacrifice is to be living. Now, the apostle, you'll notice this, you probably already have, is cho choosing his words very, very carefully. And we dare not overlook that verb, offer. If you're reading other translations this morning, I happen to be reading the NIV, but if you're reading another one, it, it may use words like to present, to give, to yield, it means to make a presentation to another, to take whatever it is and place it into the hands of another, to dedicate it to the use of another, to, to put it at someone else's disposal. What, whatever you, word you use, it means to transfer ownership and control of whatever is being offered. It's mine, but I give it to you. You can do with it whatever you please. Well, now for the key question. What is it we're to offer? Our bodies. Paul exhorts, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, now sometimes that gets a bit confusing for us because 
We only think in terms of our physical body, right? Our, you know, our, our flesh and blood. Um, that which we take to the doctor to examine and hopefully tune up for another 50,000 miles. But the word that Paul is using here is the Greek word soma, S-O-M-A. Soma means the whole total person. Everything there is about you, you and, and about me is included in our soma. So it not only includes our physical body, but also our intellect, our will, our possessions, our choices, our relationships, our career, and on and on and on. Paul declares, present to God your total being, everything, as a living sacrifice. Well, th this leads to another crucial question. How are we to make this offering? You know, as Americans, we, we are used to doing things on the installment plan, right? My suspicion is that's the way you're buying your house. You make a payment every month. That's the way you've probably bought a car or two. Maybe that's the way you, you, you bought that Bose sound system that you saw advertised on TV. You can do it in 12, quote, unquote, easy payments. So do we make, make this sacrifice in installments? Well, let's go back to Paul's word picture of the temple sacrifice. Picture in your mind that lamb being led to the altar there in the middle of the temple. Is the front right leg offered today? And then the front left leg tomorrow. And then eventually, you know, you get around to the entire lamb being sacrificed. No. The whole lamb is sacrificed all at once. And so it is that we are to make, offer our total beings to God in one act of consecration. Now, now, to help us grasp this, the apostle uses what is known as the aorist tense for the verb to offer. My English teacher back there in high school, Miss Nelson, she impressed on us greatly that verb tenses are important and they tell you a lot. Well, the aorist is a one-time event. It's immediate but it has lasting effects. It's ongoing. Now, we see examples of that in our culture. One of the most common is that, that of vows at a wedding. There have probably been a few weddings in this space. I don't know. There may be more to come, not to mention any names. But picture the scene with me. The groom and the groomsmen file out. After a while, the music comes up, and the bridesmaids start coming down the aisle and taking their place. And then finally, who appears in the back door? The bride, usually on her father's arm. He walks her down the aisle. He presents her to the groom. And then they turn and face the officiant, usually a pastor, and he starts going through the ceremony, asking them questions. Will you do this? Will you do this? Will you do this? Will you do this? And the answer at the end is supposed to be, I will. One I will takes place in a moment at a given place in time. On June the 23rd, 2023, I said I will at 2.45 in the afternoon. That happened. But it includes a lifetime of commitment and love. We are not to come to the Lord with a little bit at a time. We're to bring it all to him. That happens in a moment of commitment at a given place and point in time but it has lasting effects which include a whole life of commitment, love, and service. The apostle declares that this is a crucial, necessary act of our worship. These days, we, we struggle a little bit with the definition of worship, don't we? Uh, we ask someone, how was the service? And they'll say to you, oh, the worship was great. 
Eh, the preaching was a little mediocre. Uh, I've been there. No, the music is part of the worship and helps us to express our praise to God, but there are other components like prayer and the reading of God's word and giving. Yes, giving is an act of worship, preaching the sacraments. But you know, worship extends beyond these four walls. It isn't just in here. This is a significant act of worship when I present to God my whole person as a living sacrifice. Now, when I make this living sacrifice, it puts some things in motion as I live out this life of complete commitment to God. The sacrifice is immediate. Now, this is the ongoing part. Notice that Paul now begins speaking in terms of what he calls the pattern of this world. Hmm. What do you suppose he means by that? Well, what are some of the patterns of our world? Oh, we, we could camp out there a long time. But, but just let me mention a few of the prevalent ones so that we kind of get the idea of what, what he's talking about here, about the patterns of this world. One of the patterns of our world is materialism, right? Our culture measures everything in dollars and cents, including your worth and my worth. That's called a wrongful death suit. We measure it. People all around us are engaged in acquiring more and more and more stuff. I mean, it, it's almost as if he who has the most toys when he dies wins. Materialism. It's one of the patterns of this world. Or how about the quest for power and success? Climbing the corporate ladder at all costs, even if it costs you your marriage or your children or your health or all of the above. Then there's this thing called hedonism. You say, uh, what's that? That's the reckless pursuit of pleasure, often in the context of sexual pleasure. It recognizes very few boundaries, whether that's in entertainment or purity before marriage or faithfulness within marriage. I, I literally heard about a young man whose wife had been unfaithful to him and saw nothing wrong with it. But hedonism is not only sexual. It also includes our cultural love affair with things like, like alcohol and, and, and drugs. It's one of the patterns of this world. Oh, let, let me mention one more. Relativism. The notion that there are no absolute rights and wrongs. That sometimes it's okay to do what I would normally consider to be wrong or what someone else might consider to be wrong. You see, it, it, it's okay, perhaps, to cheat on that college entrance exam if it gets me more scholarship money. I mean, I normally wouldn't cheat, but this is important. Back to materialism. Folks, these are just some of the components of the pattern of this world. So what should we do about the pattern of this world? What's the apostle say? Do not conform any longer. You see, we're called to be nonconformists. We're called to swim cross-current to our culture. The pattern of this world is in direct opposition to our faith and values in Christ. Now, I don't, I don't need to tell you that the world exerts tremendous pressure on us to be like it, to get into step with it and conform with it, to adapt its values and habits and practices and, and, and ways of thinking. Some time ago, I read in the paper about a, a college student who had uh, admittedly partied pretty hard with her friends during her freshman year. But at the end of her freshman year, she just decided that that wasn't a lifestyle that was healthy, and, and it wasn't in her best interest. So she quit drinking and started eating better, and she got back to school. Her friends pressured her severely to join them in their activities, 
And when she re refused, they quit talking to her or associating with her. J.B. Phillips paraphrases this part of verse 2 by saying, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. See, that's the way you were B.C., before Christ. But Paul declares to us, by God's grace, don't let the world do that to you anymore. Now, let's go back to Miss Nelson. Verb tenses are important. The word conform there in verse 2 is in the present continuous. It's an ongoing process. It doesn't happen all at once or overnight. It's a growth process that the Lord leads us in. But when I give my all to the Lord in my living sacrifice, then he starts changing my lifestyle and values. You see, instead of hoarding material possessions and accumulating all that I can get my grubby little hands on, I start to be generous with God and others. Giving becomes a new pattern. Instead of blowing up and getting all defensive and protecting my turf, I become more concerned about the needs and concerns of others. Instead of recklessly pursuing this world's pleasures, I start changing my entertainment choices and viewing human sexuality in a much different light. Instead of letting situations determine what I consider to be right or wrong, I look to God in his word for his rights and his wrongs. As a result of your living sacrifice, allow the Lord to help you be less and less conformed to the pattern of this world. But notice that as a result of our living sacrifice, the, the apostle also speaks here, of a transformation that is to take place. What does it mean to be transformed? Well, quite simply, it means to be changed. Now, not superficially, you know, like putting a new coat of paint uh, on a house that has major problems, hoping that no one will notice those problems before we sell it. But it's change that comes from the inside. It's going into that house and starting the process with the structure and the systems. Now, the word transform that you see there in verse 2 comes from the word metamorphosis. How many of you remember that term? Oh, I, I see that hand. Good. It's a biology term, right? And, and back there somewhere, we had to give a definition on a test. It, it describes a change that comes from within and just totally changes the object. The classic example, of course, is the caterpillar that changes into a butterfly. Now, okay, picture it in your mind. That creepy, ugly caterpillar. You don't want to touch it. It eventually spins itself into a cocoon and goes into hiding. And then after a while, it emerges as this beautiful butterfly. That's transformation. And J.B. Phillips paraphrases this part of the verse by saying, let God remold your minds from within. When we give our all to the Lord, then he starts bending and shaping and molding us into what he desires for us to be. And what does he desire for us to be? Like Jesus. To the Corinthians, Paul declares, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Now this transformation is based on our complete commitment. You see, the potter can't mold a lump of clay unless he has total control of it. But that complete commitment starts a process that lasts a lifetime. It changes our values. Our lifestyles, our habits, our attitudes, and more from those of the world into those of Christ. As, as one Bible expert put it, until the very essence of your being is altered. And in that process, the Lord gives us the moral strength to hold to these 
and, and be victorious in them. Now, let, let's go back to Miss Nelson one more time. The verb tense is important. That word transform that you see is in the present continuous. It's an ongoing transformation process. It's a growing and, and, and maturing process. You, you know, sometimes we've, we've, we're, we've committed our all to the Lord only to be frustrated that we're still not like some dear saint we know. Relax. Don't be frustrated or discouraged because God's not through with you yet. That verb is literally go on being transformed. So how does this transformation process work? The apostle says by the renewing of your mind. God's grace starts bringing change into our lives that works its way out into every facet of our beings. Now, folks, it always starts in here. Reforming our values, changing our thought patterns, rewiring our attitudes, and some of us need a lot of rewiring. Now, this non-conforming and transforming is not something that takes place automatically once we've committed our all to the Lord. It's not like driving down to Washington, going down 270, going to Shady Grove at the metro station, and uh, getting on that escalator, and just right on along, and it plops you out at the top. No, we must cooperate with grace. We have an intentional, active role in this. Now, often that has to do with what we allow to enter our lives, you know, if God is going to change your values, you're probably going to have to, close, have to closely monitor your, your TV and music and movie choices. If God is going to renew your mind, you will probably have to expose yourself to his thoughts. You know, part of the transformation process is what we've called the disciplines of the faith. Things like prayer, Bible reading, worship. Most of us need to go on a spiritual diet, quit eating the junk food, and start consuming the right spiritual food. So, what is the result of all of this? You know, this living sacrifice that leads to this non-conforming, transforming process, what's the result? Clearer spiritual vision. The apostle declares to us, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what do we mean by God's will? Well, it's simply what God wants me to do. Now, it includes our big life choices, you know, career, choice of spouse, that kind of thing, but it also encompasses our everyday decisions. Wally is a recovering alcoholic. Let me just tell you, we have all met Wally, okay? He abused alcohol for years, but five and a half years ago, he hit bottom. Fortunately, Randy was there for him. Randy got Wally into some recovery groups, and in the process, Randy led Wally to Christ. He's been dry now five years. But even though he's been dry for five years, he is still tempted every day. Until he moved a couple of years ago, he would t Wally would take the long way, the long route home so as not to go past his favorite bar. When he goes out to eat, he still likes to go to restaurants like Bob Evans that do not serve alcohol. Well, Wally has a dilemma. His company is having their annual picnic. Oh, he would love to go. And his supervisor and a couple of, couple of his coworkers are really strongly encouraging him to do so. But the problem is this. Wally knows there will be an open bar. Now, even though it's been five years since he's had a drink, Wally's not sure he can resist the temptation. So what does God want him to do? 
What is God's will? Paul asserts that we will be able to test and approve God's will. To test means to discern. It's based on that non-conforming, transforming process that takes place in our relationship with God. So Wally wrestles with his decision. He thinks, he prays, he reads his Bible, he talks it over with his good friend Randy. Finally, he comes to the conclusion that while other recovering alcoholics might be able to handle going, he's not sure he can. Wally is discerning God's will. Now, to approve is to choose. It's putting the discerned will of God into action. It's the empowerment to make the right choice. So Wally goes to his supervisor on Monday and tells him he just won't be able to attend the picnic. Oh, the supervisor and others still try to persuade Wally, but Wally stands by his decision and what he perceives to be God's will. When we make our living sacrifice of our whole person, God straps on his tool belt and goes to work. We become less and less conformed to the pattern of this world, and we come, become more and more transformed into Christ's likeness. And the result, we have clearer spiritual vision. Now, sometimes the Bible compares the Lord's relationship to us to that of a potter and the clay. We're the clay, which he wants to, to mold and shape into a vessel that he can use and be pleased with. But you know, he can't get very far with half a piece of clay. He, he, he can't make a beautiful vase out of half a lump. Often, we want the Lord to make something beautiful out of our lives, right? In fact, we will go so far as to quote to the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. How many T-shirts have you seen that on? But then we won't give him full possession and control. The result? The result is a product that's rather odd-looking. It's certainly not what the potter intended. We must give him full possession and control of the whole lump for him to shape us and mold us into what he desires. Let me give you a living illustration of this. I suppose we all know that this is Pastor Kevin and Ashley's last Sunday with us. He's been here over seven years, and you've watched him carefully. You probably know most of his testimony. You know that he was raised in a godly home by godly parents who told him about Jesus, prayed with him, took him to a strong church where they also told him about Jesus. If you're bringing your kids to church, you are doing the right thing. But he didn't come to know the Lord personally until he went to a teen camp. You want to know why he's so passionate about this? That's where he found Christ, at a teen camp. And, and God forgave his sins. And, and Pastor Kevin started walking with the Lord personally. Well, then he went to college. You know what he majored in? Uh-huh. He majored in baseball. That's exactly right. Ashley's mouthing it to me. Uh, he loved baseball. Classes, eh, but baseball. It was at the top of his priority list until the Lord started dealing with him about who's number one, about that living sacrifice thing, about giving him his baseball. And he came to the point where he said, okay, God, it's yours. He told me yesterday that that became a mission field for him now on the team. It was no longer about him. It was about those around him. 
Well, after, after college, you know that he and Ashley got married. He actually did get a degree, by the way. It, it, it was a business degree. He became entry level. He became the manager at a car wash. But through a series of circumstances with things just not working out right, Pastor Kevin started hearing the voice of God in his life saying, this isn't what I want you to do. I don't want, I don't want you to clean the cars. I want you to help people clean up for me. And so, Pastor Kevin, as part of that non-conforming, ongoing transformation process, said, yes, I will do that. And you've had a front row seat now in watching the last seven years of that non-conforming, transforming process take place in his life. Yes, he's, he's grown professionally as, as a minister. Uh, I've had fun watching it. But folks, he's also grown in Christ-likeness, in the maturity of his faith, faith in, in discerning the will of God. We're going to talk about Pastor Kevin here for a little bit. In fact, we're going to show you some slides. But let me just talk to you for a second. We all must make that living sacrifice. There has to come a point when we say, God, I'm all in. You're number one. Everything else has to be second. Friend, you're, you're not going to be who God wants you to be or who you want to be until you make that living sacrifice to him. And, and could it be God wants you to do that this morning? So would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we hear your word. We hear your invitation to make this living sacrifice of our whole being to you. And Father, I suspect there are people here this morning that have not done that. Still holding back. Say, you can have this, this, and this, but not that. Oh, Lord, would you help them even in this moment to say yes to you and say, I give you that. It's yours. Do with it whatever you choose. For I pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to show you some slides here. Let, let, let me try to to frame this. I know this is, as, as Kelly said, this is an emotional day. Goodbyes always are. But don't be sorry that they're gone. Be glad they came. Let's watch.
Glad they came. We want to pray for them this morning. So I'd invite Pastor Kevin Ashley, Carter Hudson, come kneel. And I've asked uh, a few people to pray for them. But if you'd like to gather around as well, this is open to you. So let's gather around them and pray.
important. Thank you. We thank you and know, Lord, that the promise of your word guarantees that their seeds will come to fruition. And we will see a new thing to be said in our church to set the tone. And we will see a new thing done in their new church and in the new lives that they will be able to touch. Continue to give them peace, Lord, in this time of change. Let them know that they are loved and that this is not goodbye. We are thankful that they're still in our district and that we will see them as often as we were willing to drive. <laughs> and we just praise you, Lord, for the assurance that you've given them that they are loved and that they are in your hands and that they are protected. I thank you for their example of obedience. Father, I pray that you would go with them into this new assignment, that they would impact people for you, that uh, you would continue to nurture them and form them into who you want them to be. Lord, guide them. May they sense your presence. May you meet their needs. May you put the right people in their paths to help them. Lord, thank you for their lives and the gift you've given us in them. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's give them a chance to get out where the desserts are. And if the worship team would come and, and lead us in one last song, that would be great. So when Kevin told us that he was that they were leaving, one of the things that he said was, mm, and he still says it, that um, he was praying and he just thinks that that's what God is calling him. And a long time ago, I'd heard this hymn called "Wherever He Leads, I'll Go," and it just kind of stuck with me. Thank mm -hmm. you.
May the Lord bless you as you go out with a complete commitment to go wherever he leads. God bless.